before going into the video, keep in mind that this video is meant for revision. If you have already read the NCERT of each chapter, or watched them on YouTube, then you can revise from this video. But if you are learning a chapter for the first time, you should not watch this video. First, watch the animation videos. The link of the playlist is there in the description. If you are learning all chapters for the first time, you should first watch the playlist. Don't worry. The videos are short, interesting, and cover NCERT line by line. After that, you can watch this video, which will take about 50 minutes of your focused mind. Are you ready? Lencho's house sat on the crest of a low hill. The earth needed a little rain for a good harvest. During the meal, raindrops began to fall. He considered the drops as new coins. But suddenly the rain turned into a storm, and hailstones began to fall. They were like new silver coins. It continued for an hour, and his corn was totally destroyed. A plague of locusts would have left more than this. He decided to ask help from God. He wrote a letter addressed to God, demanding 100 pesos. The postman laughed on reading the letter, but the postmaster saw and chose faith in God, and felt it should not be shaken. He asked money from employees, and gave a part of his salary. Finally, they sent the 70 pesos to Lencho. When he found that they were not 100 pesos, he thought the post office employees have kept the rest 30 pesos. He again wrote a letter to God, requesting him to send the remaining money, but not through mail, as the employees were crooks for him. On May 10th, was the inauguration of new democratic government of Africa, in the amphitheater formed by Union Buildings of Pretoria. Mandela was accompanied by his daughter, Zunani. Mr. D. Clerks Ornan is the second deputy president. Thabo Mbeki Sornan is the first deputy president. Mandela pledged to obey and uphold the constitution, and devote to well-being of the people. An array of jets flew above the Union buildings. The smoke formed the colors of the African flag. It was not only a display of precision, but also a display of military's loyalty to democracy. The defense force and police saluted Mandela. Some years ago, they had arrested him. That day two national anthems were sung. White sang, Nkosi Saikelel Africa, Black sang, Daistem. Mandela remembered the history of 20th century. In first decade, whites made a system to oppress blacks, apartheid. In last decade, a new government has formed, that gave rights to all. Leaders were, Oliver Tambo, Walt Sisulu, Yusuf Dadu, Chief Luthuli etc. The country's people were its greatest wealth, finer than the diamond. Courage is not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. Every man has two obligations. One, to his family, wife, parents, children. Two, to his people, community, and country. But in the past, no black-skinned man of South Africa was able to fulfill the obligations. In childhood, Mandela's freedom was to run in fields, swim in stream, roast mealies, ride bulls. But when he grew up, he realized that freedom was not given to anyone. So he joined the African National Congress to fight for freedom. Oppressor is the prisoner of hatred. So both, the oppressor, and the oppressed, need to be liberated.
a young seagull was afraid of making his first flight. He lived on a ledge, but all his family members encouraged him. Once they left him on the ledge for 24 hours, he was very hungry. He went to the brink of the ledge and pretended to be falling asleep. But they didn't notice him. His mother, with a piece of fish in her feet, came near him. As he tried to grab it, she flew back. The seagull jumped and found himself flying over the sea. His father screamed. He saw a green flooring on the sea. He landed on the flooring, but it was not a flooring. He floated. His family offered him scraps of fish. At 1.30 morning, the narrator was flying his old Dakota from France to England to his home to enjoy the breakfast. When Paris was 150 kilometers behind, he saw storm clouds. He wanted the breakfast, so he flew into the storm. His Dakota twisted in the air. Nothing was visible. The instruments died. Then he saw another airplane. The pilot was saying him to follow. He followed. The fuel was going low, but then the other airplane went down saw a runway and landed. But the other airplane disappeared. He was not sorry to walk away from his old Dakota, which flew him out of a storm. He asked the control center about the other airplane. The woman told him, that his was the only airplane seen on the radar. Anne Frank began writing in her diary in June 1942. Because? She was introvert, she needed to get off her burden to something, she had no friend, with whom she could discuss her day-to-day -day happenings. It was a strange experience for her because she had never written anything. People were not interested in the musings of a 13 years old girl. Her father, Otto Frank, her mother, Edith Hollander Frank, her sister, Margot Frank. In 1941, her grandmother got ill and had an operation. So her birthday passed with little celebration. In 1942, her grandma died. In her birthday that year, her grandma's candle was lit. It was when Anne was gifted a diary. In the first entry, Anne wrote about the result day in school. She wrote about Miss Theresing, her maths teacher. He always scolded her and assigned her extra homework for her talking. One day, he gave her extra homework. An essay on the chatterbox. But she again talked. Then Mr. Easing assigned her an essay on an incorrigible chatterbox. She again talked. Now, he assigned her an essay on quack quack quack, said Mr. Chatterbox. And wrote the essay in verses with her friend, San. Mr. Keesing was impressed by the poem. He read it in the class and other classes too. The elders of Goa are nostalgic about those old days. Though the bakers of that time have died, their sons carry on the profession. The baker came twice a day. Once in mourning for selling around, then again when he returned after emptying his basket. The narrator and other children loved the bread bangles. Loaves were given to the servants. These were important. Bowl for marriage, bread for party, sandwich for engagement, cakes balloonhas for fest. The baker in old days wore kabai, a long frock. 
In narrator's childhood, the baker wore a shirt and a trouser, which reached just below the knees. He collected his bills at the end of the month. Monthly accounts were recorded on some wall by pencil. The bakers never starved. Their plump physique was a testimony to this. Korgar Kodag lies between Mangalore and Mysore. It is a small district of Karnataka. Korg is famous for coffee, evergreen forests and spice gardens. The Korgi people are possibly of Arabic or Greek descent because they wear long coat and belt known as kapia. It resembles the kafia worn by the Arabs. The Korgi men are brave. The Korg regiment is one of the most awarded in the Indian army. They are the only people in India allowed to carry firearms without license. A variety of natural scenes attract tourists. Kaveri, full of mahasirs, gets its water from Korg Hills. One can see elephants, squirrels langur, kingfishers, birds and flies. Korg offers river rafting, canoeing, rappelling, rock climbing and mountain biking. Trekkers find walking trails there. One can reach the 64-acre island of Nisargadham through rope bridge. Buddhist monks can be seen with red, ochre, and yellow robes. Prain Joel invited Rajver to his state asylum in summer vacations. They both went asylum through train. In the train, Prangel read books. Richver looked out at the tea bushes. Richver was interested in talking about tea, but Prangel, being born in tea gardens, was not excited. Richver had read about tea before. He told Prangel of two legends about tea. Twig leaves fell into a Chinese emperor's water pot. It tasted delicious. Body Dharma cuts his eyelids for meditation. They grew into tea leaves. The train stopped at Mariana Junction. Prain Joel's parents were waiting. They four went in car to Takiyabari, the tea estate managed by Prain Joel's father. On both sides of the road were tea bushes. Women with baskets at back were plucking tea leaves. The narrator, Maxwell, traveled to Iraq in 1956. He thought he should keep an otter, and Kamusfernia was suitable for this. When he told his idea to a friend, he advised to get an otter from Tigris Marshes. They had to go to Basra to answer a mail. His mail arrived five days later. He carried it to his bedroom where he found a sack beside two Arabs in his room. It was his otter. The otter resembled a small dragon, coated with pointed scales. Between the tips was a fur. He called it Mijbil. Mijbil's race was named as Lutrogal Perspicillina Maxwelli. Second night, Mijbil became more friendly. He made a belt for him. In the bathroom, he would enjoy for half an hour. Two days later, Mijbil disappeared from the bedroom. Maxwell went to the bathroom and found him turning the tap to produce water. Midge would now follow him without a lead when he called his name. He spent hours playing with rubber ball and juggling small objects. The days passed peacefully at Basra. But Maxwell was afraid of transporting Midge to England. 
he booked a flight to Paris. From there, to London. The airline insisted that Mitch should be packed in a small box. He left the box for meal. When he returned, he found blood trickling from the box. On opening it, Midge caught his leg. He had torn the lining of the box. Then he put Midge again into the box, and hurried off to the airport. In the aircraft, Midge leapt out of the box. He disappeared. The woman screamed. Maxwell saw Midge below the legs of an Indian. The air hostess told him to resume his seat. Finally Midge bounced on his knee and nuzzled his face. He remained in London for a month. Midge invented a game. The lid of a damaged suitcase remained at a slope. Midge would slide ping pong ball on it. Outside, he'd exercise him, just like a dog. On the way home, Midge would always walk on a low wall along a school. Maxwell considers it common for a Londoner to not to recognize an otter. The variety of guesses about Midge surprised him. Otters belong to a small group of animals called mustelines, shared by badger, mongoose, mink, and others. Some random guesses of what animal Midge was were a squirrel, baby seal, walrus, hippo, beaver, bear cub, a leopard, and a brontosaurus. But the question for which Maxwell awarded the highest score came from a labor digging a hole. He asked, what is that supposed to be? Vali Amir Vali was an eight years old girl. Her favorite pastime was watching the street. The most fascinating thing for her was the bus that traveled between her village and nearest town. Gradually, her wish of the ride in the bus became an overwhelming desire. For months, she listened conversations of people. She found the town was six miles away, the fare was 30 pays, it took 45 minutes from village to the town. One day, she stopped the bus and entered. The conductor was a funny man who made fun of her. It was a new bus, outside painted white with some green stripes. Inside, overhead bars shone like silver. Her view was cutting off by a canvas blind. So she stood up on the seat, to enjoy the view outside. Someone advised her to sit down as she could fall. She replied that she was not a child. The bus stopped and some new passengers got on. Afraid of losing her seat, she sat down. An elderly woman sat beside her. Fully found her repulsive, big holes in her earlobes, ugly earring in them, chewing beetle juice. The woman asked Vully if she was traveling alone. She said that it's wrong for a child to travel alone. Vully told her not to bother. A young cow was running in the middle of the road. The driver slowed the bus and sounded the horn. This was funny to Valley. The bus passed a train station. Then it passed a busy thoroughfare. Fully was struck dumb with wonder. When the bus reached the destination, she bought another ticket to village. The conductor offered to bring a drink, but she disagreed. On the way back, she saw a young cow lie dead. It was the same cow she saw before. Its memory haunted her. She didn't look outside. What had been a lovable creature had now suddenly lost its charm in life. At home, she found her mother and aunt talking about the things that happened in the world without their knowledge. Valley agreed. They didn't know why she said, but she knew her bus ride was unknown to them. Gautam Buddha began his life as a prince, Siddharth Gautam, in northern India. At twelve, 
he was sent for schooling to study Hindu sacred scriptures. After four years, he married. After ten years, while hunting, he came across a sick man, an old man. A funeral procession, a monk begging. These sights moved him. He wandered to seek enlightenment, to know the reason of sorrows. After seven years, he sat under a people tree and meditated. After seven days of meditation, he got enlightened. He named it Body Tree. He himself came to be known as the Buddha. He preached his first sermon in Banaras. Kizagatami's only son died. She took him door to door to ask for medicines. A man told her that Buddha could cure her child. She went to Buddha and requested him to cure her child. Buddha asked for a handful of mustard seeds from a house where no one had ever died. But she couldn't find a house as such. As she looked at the city lights flickering and extinguishing, she realized death is common. Yet when someone surrenders all selfishness, it leads to immortality. Buddha says that immortal's life is troubled and painful. The ripe fruit is always in danger of falling. Vessels of potter will break. Similarly mortals will die. Lamenting can't cure a dead. Ivan Lamov went to Chuputkov, his neighbor, to ask the hand of his daughter, Natalia. He was wearing an evening dress. Chupukov thought he had come to borrow money. He asked Lamov why he was wearing an evening dress. When Lamov told his purpose behind the visit, Chupukov became very happy. He went to send Natalia. Lomov thought that Natalia was a good housekeeper and well educated. He was already 35 and he had palpitations from excitement. Natalia didn't know he had come to propose her. She talked about their hay crop. Then Lamov talked about his oxen meadows. Natalia told that oxen meadows were theirs. Her ancestors reckoned that their land extended to burnt marsh. Means the meadows were theirs. Lomov pointed that his aunt's grandma gave use of the meadows to peasants of Natalia's father's grandpa. Thus, they thought it was their own. Lomov suffered from palpitations whenever he got nervous. Chupukov came in hearing their arguments. He asked them what happened. He also insisted that oxen meadows were theirs. The peasants didn't pay Lomov's grandpa, as the land was in dispute. He and Natalia insulted Lomov and his relations. He felt palpitations. He staggered out. Chupukov and Natalia abused him. Chupukov told her that Lomov had come to propose her. Natalia began to cry. She wanted to marry Lomov. She asked her father to bring him back. Chupukov cursed himself for being father of a girl. He brought Lomov back. To change the topic, Natalia asked him about his hunting. Lomov replied that his dog, Guess, had gone lamb. When Natalia argued that their squeezer was better than Guess, he told that squeezer was overshot, thus the dog was a bad hunter. Natalia said that Guess was old and ugly. When Chupukov entered, he took the side of his daughter. He told he didn't want to lose his temper. As the fight rose, Lomo felt pain in his heart, he fell into an armchair. When he got up, Chupukov forced them to marry each other. He wanted to remove his burden. But they again started arguing that their respective dogs were better.
Mrs. Pumphrey was a very rich lady. She overpampered her dog, Tricky. She gave him extra food, thinking he was suffering from malnutrition. This worsened his condition. He became a bloated sausage with bloodshot eyes. He took no interest in his favorite dishes. He had some vomits. She called Mr. Harriet an experienced vet surgeon, also the narrator. He told that Tricky had to be hospitalized for a fortnight, that is, 14 days. She thought Tricky will die if he doesn't see her every day. She sent his day bed, night bed, cushions, toys, and bowls. Mr. Harriet made a bed for Tricky in a loose box, next to the place where other dogs slept. He gave him no food, but plenty of water for two days. Then he began to recover. Tricky played with other dogs. He had never had such time in his life. Mr. Harriet told her that Tricky was recovering. Mrs. Pumphrey thought he had undergone some surgery. She began sending eggs, brandy, and wine for Tricky to make him recover fast. But Mr. Harriet and his assistants enjoyed the food every day. No food was given to Tricky. He wanted to keep Tricky as a permanent guest. But thinking about Mrs. Pumphrey, he told her that Tricky was recovered. Mrs. Pumphrey came to the surgery. Tricky ran and jumped into her arms. She said that it was a triumph of surgery, but no surgery was done with Tricky. The narrator was a 15 years old thief. He often changed his name to keep himself ahead of police. He met Anil, about 25, watching a wrestling match. He tells his name, Hari Singh, and told him that he wanted to work for him. Anil agreed, and took him to his room over the Jamna sweet shop. Anil hired him as his cook, and in exchange, he would feed him. Anil taught him to cook and write sentences. Hari made tea in the morning, and went to buy the day's supplies. He made a profit of rupee every day. One evening, Anil came home with a bundle of notes. He had sold a book to a publisher. He saw him put the money under the mattress. When Anil was asleep, Hari drew the money out and crawled out of the room. He decided to catch the 1030 Express to Lucknow, but he didn't jump into the drain. Now he was alone. He had to go back to Anil. He rushed back to the room and put the notes back under the mattress. Next morning, Hari woke up late. Anil had made the tea. He gave Hari a 50 rupee note, wet from the rain last night. Anil knew about the theft. Azabal was a secret agent, but he didn't fit in any description of a secret agent. He was fat and had an improper accent. Fowler was a romantic writer. He met Ausable to get interesting stories. Ausable lived in a room in French Hotel on the 6th, top floor. He told Fowler that an important report was arriving at 12.30. When he turned on the lights, he saw a man stood with pistol in the room. The man was Max, a secret agent. He had come to grab the report. Ausable cursed the hotel management. He pretended to guess that Max came from Balcony. But Max hadn't used the passkey. Ausable told him that the balcony of the next room extended under his window. Management didn't block it. Someone knocked the door. Ausable told it was the police. 
Max jumped from the window. But there was no balcony. Max fell from the sixth floor and died. Horace Danby made locks. He was good and respectable, but not completely honest. He loved rare books. He robbed a safe every year. With the money, he bought the books through an agent. He went to a house at Shodover Grange. The family was in London and the servants had gone to movies. A magazine article had described the house, giving a plan of all the rooms. The writer even mentioned that a picture hid a safe. The bowl of flowers tickled his nose. He often suffered from hay fever. A female voice came from the doorway. The woman came to him. She told him that he couldn't escape. Horace requests her to let him go. She told that her jewels were in the safe, but she had forgotten the password. She offered that if Horace could open it, she would pardon him. He opened the safe within an hour and went away. But two days later, a policeman arrested him for robbery at Shodover Grange. As he had removed his gloves, his fingerprints were all over the room. The lady who was there was also a thief. Griffin, a scientist, discovered drugs to make human body transparent. He swallowed certain drugs and became invisible. Two boys were surprised to see the footprints that appeared on the mud, the footprints without feet. Both chased the footprints, but after some time, the footprints disappeared. Griffin lived on rent. His landlord always tried to eject him out of the house. In revenge, Griffin set fire to the house. Thus he became a homeless wanderer, without clothes and money. It was midwinter January. He entered a London store for warmth. When it closed, he wore clothes from the store and became a visible person, but headless. He ate meat and coffee kept there. He slept on a pile of quilts. In the morning, he woke up. The assistants chased him. He took out the clothes to escape. He thought that he had to find not only clothes, but also something to cover his head. He found a suitable shop in Drury Lane, the center of theater world. He wore clothes, bandages, dark glasses, false nose, whiskers and hat. He attacked the shopkeeper and took all the money. He went to village shopping by train. He booked two rooms in the local inn. Mrs. Hall, the landlord's wife, thought that the arrival of a strange person at an inn at that time was strange. Griffin told them that he didn't want to be disturbed. As he had paid in advance, she decided to excuse his anger and strange habits. Shortly afterwards, two events occurred. 1. At a clergyman. 2. At the landlord's. A clergyman heard noises in the study. He thought some thief was there. He silently went there. But the room was empty. The money was missing. A little later, Mr. and Mrs. Hall found Griffin's room's door opened. They entered in to investigate. The bed was cold. His clothes, bandages, etc. were lying. Suddenly, a hat flew and dashed Mrs. Hall's face. The chair flew and pushed both out. Mrs. Hall thought that the room was haunted. Her mother used to sit on that chair. The suspicion for the two episodes became stronger on Griffin when he gave the rent. 
but he had told before that he had no money. The village constable was secretly sent for, to catch him. Mrs. Hall asked Griffin what he was doing with a chair, and how he entered a locked room. Griffin became angry. He took off bandages, head etc., and became headless. The constable arrived. He tried to catch him. Griffin took off his clothes and became invisible. He hit the constable and knocked him unconscious. There were cries of hold him. But no one dared. Richard Ebright grew up in north of Reedlings, Pennsylvania. He collected butterflies, rocks, fossils. His mother encouraged him, took him on trips, and bought equipments. When he was in his second grade, he had collected 25 species of butterflies. His mother got him a book, The Travels of Monarch 10. At the end of the book, readers were invited to tag butterflies for research by Dr. Frederick Urquhart. Ebright did. Then he raised butterflies and tagged them. He participated in many science fairs in the years of his study. 7, 8, 9 grade. Second year high school, junior year high school, senior year high school, junior year Harvard University. In the seventh grade, he showed frog tissues. He lost. In eighth grade, he tried to find the cause of a viral disease that killed monarch caterpillars. He won. In ninth grade, he tested a theory that viceroy butterflies copy monarchs. This project was placed first in zoology. In second year, he researched on the tiny spots on monarch pupa. He and his friend found that the spots produced hormones. They won. In junior year, he continued his advanced experiments on the pupa. He won and got a chance to work in Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. In senior year, he grew cells from a monarch's wing and showed the hormone from gold spots were necessary for its development. He won first in zoology. During junior year in Harvard University, he got the idea for his new theory about cell life. He answered how the cell reads blueprint of its DNA. He and his roommate James explained the theory in an article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Mr. Weeher, his SST teacher, told that Richard won because he wanted to do the best. Start with a first-rate mind, mix in the will to win for right reasons. Matilda Loisel's husband was a clerk in Board of Education. She felt she was born for all luxuries, but suffered poverty. She didn't like to visit her rich friend, because when she returned, she cried whole days from despair. One evening, her husband showed him a card. They were invited to a ball. He thought she would be happy. She started crying, because she had no suitable dress to wear at the ball. A new dress would cost 400 francs. Her husband had saved 400 francs to buy a gun to join hunting parties, but he gave her the money. Some days later, she told him that she didn't have a jewel. Her husband advised her to ask her friend for a year to lend her her jewels. Next day, she went to Madame for a year. Finally she found a necklace of diamonds. Madame Forestier lent her the necklace. The day of the ball arrived. Madame Loisel was the prettiest of all. She was full of joy. At four in the morning, they found a carriage and went to their apartment. Madame Loisel found the necklace missing. They checked everywhere but in vain. They didn't remember the number of the cab if the necklace must have fallen in the cab. 
Loisel went out to find it. After three hours, he returned with empty hands. He told her to write a letter to her friend that the necklace was being repaired. He decided that they had to replace the jewel. In the shop of Palais Royal, they could get exactly the same necklace for 36,000 francs. He had 18,000 francs, which his father had left him. He borrowed the rest making promises. They bought the jewel and gave it to Madame Forestier. They sent away the maid, rented the rooms. Madame Loiselle worked herself. Her husband worked evenings and nights. Finally they had restored all. One Sunday, walking in champ Madame Loiselle found her friend. Forestier told her that the necklace was false. It was not worth over 500 francs. Her name was Sulika, but everyone called her Polly. She was the fourth daughter of number Daraim Lal. She remained backwards, because, when she was ten months old, she fell ever caught on head at two, she had smallpox. She looked ugly. She couldn't speak till five, and she stammered. Raimul had three sons and four daughters. It was a prosperous family. Sons had been sent to colleges. A school for girls opened in the village. Taya Sildar told Raimlil to send Polly there. Raimlil and his wife were reluctant to send girls to school, but he couldn't disobey the Taya Sildar. Raimlil took Polly to school. She was given a new dress. The pictures on the wall fascinated her. When the teacher asked her name, she couldn't speak. When the class was over, the teacher helped her to speak her name. She spoke her name. It was a great achievement. Her heart was throbbing with a new life. Years later, Raimlil and his wife talked about Polly's marriage with Bishamber. He was an old man, Laman already married. The marriage was fixed. When Polly's veil was pulled, Bishamber saw her pockmarks. Bishamber demanded 5,000 rupees from Raimlal, but Raimlal gave him the money. When the groom raised the garland, Polly threw the garland and veil away. She rejected to marry such a greedy man. And when Bishamber went back with his party, Raimlal asked Polly who will marry her then. She comforted him that she would help him and mother in old age and teach in the school. The historian shows the audience how Book Mother Goose saved the earth from the Martian invasion of 2040. Think Tank was the commander in chief of Mars Space Control. He considered himself as the most intelligent creature in the universe. Apprentice Noodle was actually more intelligent than him, but had to respect him. They had sent a crew to the Earth. The crew had entered the Centerville Public Library. They were Captain Omega, Lieutenant Iota, and Sergeant Toop. Looking at the books with his goggles from Mars, Think Tang said that they were sandwiches. He ordered Omega to eat it. Sergeant Toop had to eat the book. He told that it was dry and not delicious. Noodle told Think Tank that it was some sort of communication device. Think Tank agreed and told the crew to listen to them. Then Noodle told him that the humans didn't listen to it, but watched it. Think Tank orders Omega to watch it. After swallowing vitamins, they could understand the words. Omega read a poem about a garden growing cockle shells and silver bells. Think Tank was alarmed, thinking it was true. Another rhyme meant that a cow jumped over the moon, and Dog laughed. 
Think Tang thought Earthlings had reached high level of civilization. Another verse was about Humpty Dumpty falling down a wall. The picture resembled Think Tank's large head. He thought Earthlings knew about the invasion. He ordered the crew to leave Earth. He decided to leave Mars and go to Alpha Sanctuary. Thus, a book of nursery rhymes saved the Earth from a Martian invasion. Humans had made friendship with Noodle, the new chief.